Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Um, it is Saturday, it is 10 o'clock, and we are about to embark on a quite a difficult, it's heavy... It's Saturday, not Sunday. <laughs> Um, quite, a, quite a difficult and, and heavy topic, um, but I hope that it will be illuminating because it's an incredibly important topic. I think every single day when you just turn on the news or open the uh, newspaper, it's something that we cannot not think about. So we are going to talk about South Africa and xenophobia and the ongoing vulnerability of foreign nationals in South Africa. My name is Karina Šturek, and you can hear already from my accent, and you can see from my name and from this face um, that I am also a foreigner living in South Africa. On my very um, left is um, Vanya Gastrov. Uh, in the middle, Fred Kumalo. And on my left, is uh, P Pacific Cali Caliber Calibera Uwaza? Yes. yes. Um, we were <clears throat> learning how to pronounce our names earlier. We are here to speak about this incredibly big and important topic, but we are going to do it through the lens of these three remarkable books. Um, so, Vanya's Citizen and Pariah, Somali Traders and the Regulation of Difference in South Africa, P. Pacific's um, Witnessing from the Rwandan Tragedy to, the, to Healing in South Africa, and Crossing the River by Fred. Um, they are all very recent, and Fred's is fresh off the press. So. Before we begin speaking about the books and the topics, I want to ask you two things. I don't want to read your biographical notes. I would like you to introduce yourself in a few words in the context of this topic. Who are you? Where do you come from? And, um, and just a few words. What do you do? Um. So my name is Vanya. My background is actually law. Um, and as a candidate attorney at a corporate law firm, I kind of stumbled on this topic, um, reading a newspaper article one day. Um, and the article was about um, contestations between foreign shopkeepers and South African shopkeepers and meetings held. And I was really interested in um, kind of what these um, debates and um, meetings kind of revealed about South African society. And so further down the road, I eventually became involved in researching um, issues relating to migration, law, and society. And it culminated in a book. <laughs> Hi, my name is Fred Kumalo. I'm a journalist by training. I've, I've worked for a number of newspapers, both uh, locally and uh, internationally. But I also write um, books um, across different genres, nonfiction, fiction, short stories, essays, and so on. Uh, within the context of today's uh, proceedings, uh, many of the books, the topics that I tackle, are triggered by uh, injustice. So in this instance, I thought, like George Orwell, um, who is uh, inspired by injustice, and injustice has been committed, not only are we supposed to bear witness to that, what do we do about it? What can mm. we do about it? Hence, this novel, which is about, well, we'll talk about later. Yeah. But, um, right. Pacific. <clears throat> So P. Pacific, uh, Kavalira Owase, I'm uh, from Rwanda. Uh, actually, as of May last year, I'm living more time in South Africa than I have in Rwanda. Uh, I arrived here uh, at 20. Um, I, I, I never, I had never intended to come to South Africa, and even when I came, it was transit, because I needed to get here, organize myself, and go somewhere else. And, and then I made a series of decisions and circumstances that um, 
convinced me to settle here. I, I got a chance to go to all the places I was dreaming of going to, in America and Europe, and I still chose to come back to South Africa. Um, I'm a management consultant. I have a, a management consulting firm. And uh, this is my, my first book, um, hopefully not the last one. Um, and I, I, it, it was, it's a personal journey, and I was really grappling with the, um, the issue of identity and, and, and who I am in the worlds that I have lived in. Um, so that's how I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in a sense, you and I defy the laws of uh, migration because uh, nowadays South Africans are so worried about S South Africans leaving South Africa. Yeah. But uh, even though you and I have a choice to live elsewhere, we choose to live in South Africa. Yeah. Um, um, just briefly so that you understand why I think I've been chosen to chair this session. Um, I am Polish by birth. And when I was 10 years old, my parents, um, um, my family, uh, fled the back then communist Poland, and they fled the totalitarian regime, and we became refugees via Italy in Austria. And I spent the next two years of my life in refugee camps in Austria before we were granted asylum in um, America. And we lived there for a while and then came back to Europe. And my family is still in Austria, my immediate family. Um, um, my father is living back in Poland. And uh, I chose to um, come to South Africa for research for the first time in 2004. And then I fell in love with a South African and decided to move here because I loved the country before I loved the man. And, um, and um, yeah, and I've been living here like you. Uh, very soon it will be the longest that I've ever spent in the country. Um, to turn to the books, um, Vanya, you, you indicated already that you came into this topic uh, from a research perspective. Um, but surely there must have been something in your imagination, and I think that Fred briefly mentioned that you come from a family with a political background, that, that kind of led you in that direction. What was it that made you want to investigate this particular Yeah, um, I think that what, what first drew me into it was actually negotiations well, the, the article that I read in the newspaper when I was a lawyer, it was about negotiating about the right to space. And there was a demand being made by South African shopkeepers that foreign shopkeepers, sh they, their numbers should be reduced in the area of Guguletu, which is a township in Cape Town. They should fix their prices. They should move their shops 100 meters from South African shops. And I think it sent warning bells in my mind because I grew up in Durban in a very segregated area where I remember, you know, black people had to leave my white neighborhood at a certain time of day and I grew up in segregated schools and there was just something about these demands which made me really uncomfortable and feel like, okay, we need to explore why this is coming up right now. Um, so it was possibly, you know, my parents being relatively politically active, but I think I was sheltered from a lot of that as a child. Um, but it was also just bringing back these sharp memories of segregation as a child and thinking this shouldn't be coming, it's, it looked like it was returning. Mm. Uh, Fred, what sparked your, the idea for your novel? Why, why did you feel that you needed to write this particular book? And could you give us, because it's really fresh off the press, so I doubt that anybody would have read it. Could you give us a brief plot summary of what the book is about? Yeah, the, the title is uh, Crossing the River and it's, uh, it's a story featuring um, a young girl or young woman of uh, 15, Nozizwe, who is uh, Zimbabwean by birth. And uh, the story uh, traces her odyssey 
from Zimbabwe to South Africa. Um, why did I tell, tr decide to tell that story through, from her perspective? Is, as a journalist, I've covered the story of Zimbabwe since 1991. The first time I went over there was in 1991, when things were still optimistic and rosy and so on. And then the next time I went there to do a story was 10 years later when the land invasion started. Um, okay, I know the, the term land invasion is controversial. Uh, some people would call it land reclamation. But um, that came with a lot of violence, uh, which we covered uh, for the newspapers. And then fast forward uh, 20 years later, we have seen an influx of uh, people from Zimbabwe into South Africa and uh, tensions between locals, South Africans, and the newly arrived Zimbabweans uh, exploding into xenophobic or foment. So the story is just so big and vast. How do you tell that um, comprehensively through a series of newspapers? It's always a challenge. Mm. So, and uh, some, as a result, the gravity of the situation sometimes get lost between the, the quotable quotes and uh, the pictures that you see on TV. Uh, people do not really appreciate what is happening there. So I thought, uh, for me, to show the impact of uh, this xenophobic ferment, the violence, the displacement, uh, and everything that came with it, why not tell the story from the perspective of a child? To show the reader the, the gravity, the seriousness of the situation, and how it impacts on families, children, and so on. So the voice is that of a 15-year-old girl um, through, he, through whose eyes we see this family being um, forced to, to, to flee their home because the war veterans are, are taking farms and taking over farms. And so they cross the river into South Africa hoping for a better life. And we know what happens uh, mm. in South Africa. Vanya, mm. your book is academic, um, but uh, if I may say, uh, it is really accessibly and beautifully written. So thank you for that. <laughs> there is no academic jargon whatsoever. So please read it. It's, it's a, extremely informative and accessible. Fred's book is a novel, so it's complete fiction based on the kind of stories that you have encountered in your journalistic yeah. life. Yeah. But your story, P. Pacific, is the most personal of them all. It is a memoir. Can you tell us what the outline of the story that you tell in this book, because it basically contains so much. Um, how, how, how would you summarize? What is your book about? Yeah. So for a, for a long time, uh, after arriving here in South Africa, I resisted engaging with the memories of Rwanda, because I was 13 when, uh, on school holiday, the presidential plane was shot down and uh, hell uh, broke loose. And now, uh, the, the absurdity of what I lived through in Rwanda actually dawned on me here in South Africa, that you're a 13-year-old on holiday uh, and you will wake up tomorrow and people you might know will be killing people you might know in the streets. Uh, the, the absurdity of that and, and, and perhaps the seriousness of that is, is still becoming clear to me. Uh, eventually when I got the courage to explore and engage with these memories, I, I decided to actually intentionally go and witness what I lived through. And it's, so witnessing is it's one thing to be there, but it's actually another thing to be there willingly in, in memory. And, and I was there willingly, and I kept going back and back. Eventually, I actually uh, found a way to, um, to write it down, what I was witnessing myself. And that's why the book is actually called Witnessing, because I myself am witnessing this child growing up, uh, my mother, my, my family, the people around me, um, 
and, and I'm inviting the reader to witness with me. And then eventually I had to leave the country and, and um, it, when I left Rwanda, there was a promise that in Tanzania it will be arranged that I go to Canada. Um, it didn't happen like that. And when I arrived in Maputo, uh, my mother thought I was in Canada. Um, and, and then that's in Maputo where everything changed. And I met somebody who said, your only choice now is to go to South Africa, which had happened to be the only country I had said I would never go to. <laughs> um, and, and, and I came, uh, or, as I said, really in transit. But when I discovered, this is uh, perhaps part of the topic, uh, that when I discovered that if you have good tertiary education here, you can make the world your place uh, uh, to, to, to go to willingly whenever, whenever you want. So I decided I'm going to stop being in transit. I'm going to go and study. So I went and I engaged in this fight with the University of Natal at the time to get me admitted. And of course, the doors were shut. You know, the scientists in the Faculty of Science, they gave me a place to study with financial aid. The, the student funding center said, we have never done this. It never happened that we give financial aid to a non-South African. And the faculty apologized to me. The finance department said it's never going to happen. And I'm there, I'm thinking, I'm going to climb through the echelons of this university until I get to the last person. I was the vice chancellor. And that's what I did. Um, eventually, I ended up in the dean of student services office Trevor Wills, and he says, actually, you have a point. <laughs> uh, we, we, our university talks about foreigners as international students, and they also talk about South Africans, but you are neither. You, 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 you don't have a passport and a scholarship. You are not a citizen, and we don't have a policy about you. And so he, he then took it to the council. He took weeks after <laughs> lectures had started, and, uh, and then I was a car guard and a student at the same time. So I went to his office and I said, look, by the time you get this done, I will have dropped out uh, because I, I need to pay rent. You can't. Uh, and so he said, anything. what do you want me to do? I said, give, give me a place in res. Mm -hmm. And he laughed <laughs> at that because uh, it was bold uh, of me to ask. But he got me a place in res before my financial aid package was, was, was finalized because he understood what, what was happening. Mm. Um, and so I went in residence as a, as a refugee student with no financial aid and with a basmati rice bag full of red coins, you know, mm. those 20 cents and, and 10 cents. For two months I lived on that mm. uh, until it was all done. So, but I got the degree and then I got a bank job and then I decided I can actually become what I wanted to become. I really believed that. Um, and, uh, and I got to go to all those places. But mm. along the way, I've seen what being a foreigner in South Africa is like. Mm. You already mentioned uh, the word when then hell broke loose. We know that the, and, and I think it's very important to go back to the roots of xenophobia. Mm. And, and, and I think um, you, Vanya, has, have, have a wonderful um, uh, working definition here of xenophobia has been defined as the fear or hatred of others based on ethnic, national, or racial back background, or highly negative perception of non-citizen groups on the basis of the citizenship and foreign origin. But what you then point out, and I think that is extremely important, that the, the that second part of xenophobia, so xenos, it can either be the, the, the foreigner or I think also very important to remember, it can be guest. So it's the foreigner or the guest. And the phobia is fear, not hatred, you point out. And I think that is extremely important because it all begins not necessarily with what we then witness on the horrific end of xenophobia, mm -hmm. which is then genocide. Um, but you point out that there is unease and avoidance. 
And this led me to, to you know, it's very, we, we, we are not going to change the world today. We are not going to make huge inroads into this huge topic. Um, but I think what is very important is just to reflect because understanding and comprehension and empathy mm. is the only weapon that we have against this, this irrational fear. So what, what I was wondering, thinking about this topic is, could you go back in your memories, when was it the first time ever before hell mm. breaks loose, that as a child or as a young person growing up, you felt either that fear of the other or you were actually the one doing the fearing mm. and on the receiving end? Uh, I'm originally from the kingdom by the coast, uh, uh, KZN. Uh, and I grew up in the 1970s when the country was um, highly segregated, not only uh, racially, but uh, in terms of uh, national groups and so on. So if you, as a black person, Zulu speaking, were born in Durban, the only people that you knew that you would have been exposed to would be your immediate neighbors who were of the same uh, kind of um, linguistic group. Uh, even if you lived in Soweto, for example, which is very cosmopolitan, Soweto was segregated according to tri so-called tribal lines. Mm -hmm. So they you would go to a Zulu school, live in the uh, Zulu neighborhood, and the minute you, you cross in, into the next, let's say you are from Midlands, and, you're going to study. Study is for uh, so-called Sutu people. So their attention's already, because this is the design. This is social engineering to say we are not the same. Mm. Yeah, that's how it was structured. We are not the same. So now I'm in, in KZN, which is predominantly Zulu speaking, and um, we get told stories, even in the neighborhood. Uh, Zulu, I mean, uh, Bondo people are like this, uh, Basutu people are like this. We've never seen these people. Well, we didn't realize that. In fact, in the same street, these people that we interact with, Malefanes, okay, we didn't know that they were Sutu, but they were Sutu, but they, because they didn't want to um, celebrate their Sutuness, because it might lead to them being marginalized, they behaved like Zulu-speaking people, and they would say the same insults about Basutu people as well in order to belong. Mm -hmm. And then one is now 12, 13 years, and we realize, no, Joseph Malefani is actually Musutu. Now I'm confused. I'm supposed not to like this guy, mm -hmm. you see, because he's the other person. Uh, he's supposed to be doing things that uh, are not acceptable. I'm supposed not to like... Um, um, uh, 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 Mbondo people or Tosa people because they're supposed to do things that are um, uncivilized and so on. Meanwhile, on the same street, we have an old man called Uba Bumfene. Uba Bumfene was a Mbondo guy. So you see, you see uh, the, 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 this whole social design was such that uh, we should be scared of the other. We should uh, be hateful of the other. Um, without the reason. It was so irrational, the whole thing. Mm. Unfortunately, um, some of us never outgrew that fear, so that um, every now and then it does manifest. So when we uh, don't have enough Zimbabweans to hate, we don't have uh, enough uh, 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 Mozambicans to hate, we are going to go back to saying, oh, I'm Zulu, I'm supposed to dislike you because you are Sutu or you are Tosa or you are Mbondo and so on. Because it serves the interests of those who govern, divide and rule. Yeah. You see? <clears throat> and it's so often mobilized, and I think your story, the, the story that you tell, it's so often mobilized on purpose in order to achieve certain political goals. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a very unifying thing, um, you know, you can, so I think it's a classic form of mobilization where you can unite people by finding a common enemy. 
Um, and in South Africa, you can draw a whole range. I don't think xenophobia in South Africa is um, limited to one ethnic or racial or religious group. It's really across the board, and it's something that can really unite you know, all South Africans. Um, but then there's a problem, because once you engender that kind of politics, um, a kind of mob mentality, um, one that's really you, you unifying people, but through something really negative um, and harmful, rather than something positive and principled and elevated, then once, you know, as Fred was saying, you remove the enemy, then you end up in quite a desperate situation having to find someone else. Um, and that's why it's particularly dangerous, not just for the, the group that might be targeted now, but um, where that leads everyone. You, in, in the context of your book, you are the researcher, you are the, per, the person also witnessing something and reporting from the sideline, and yet you are very conscious of your position. You are a white woman going into spaces that are not necessarily easy to access, and yet you carry, just by the way that you look, you carry a kind of privilege into those spaces, and you can command things, and you have freedom of access and movement that is not given to the people that you are interacting with. Can you talk us a little bit through, through that kind of insider-outsider position that you found yourself in? Yeah, so there were many kind of conveniences for being a white woman. Um, if you do research amongst people who might be foreign, and also being educated, middle class, um, people, yeah, you, and I think, especially if I was researching conflict within a township setting, um, I wasn't particularly embroiled in it myself, so there was also that kind of distance. Um, but also, I have access to things, so advice, um, people would, I was, there's a section in my book where I, I kind of helped a lot of Somalis through the power of my accent. <laughs> if people needed a phone call to be made, um, it was easier for me to phone a hospital than for them because I command a certain power through the way I speak. Um, yeah, so, and it puts you in a, well, put me in an uncomfortable position because I knew that I'm trying to help someone but I'm also playing into um, something problematic in South Africa, into our, um, yeah, into, into my own privilege. I'm, I'm kind of using it in a way to help people, but also reinforcing um, the social dynamics of our society, which are problematic. Mm. I think that in, in, a, in a strange way, that kind of outsider, insider position is something that on the one hand, should have saved your life during the genocide, and on the other side, it, it really was very precarious because your family found, you found yourself in an in a extreme position of vulnerability because of the connection that your uh, father had to the political elites. Mm. Could you explain that situation to us? What was it like as a, as a child to be always on the wrong side of that fear? Uh, no, it's, in, it's interesting. If, if I can go back to your earlier question about the earliest memory of mm. othering that I remember, yes. it was the Chinese. Oh, wow. <laughs> so so we, my family, we lived about 150 meters from uh, the property of the richest man in the country at the time, who is, by the way, very soon going to be tried for genocide. He's a, he's a Kabuga. He's a, uh, he is the famous financier of the genocide. That's how he's, he's labeled. And his building, which is a multi-story building, was the biggest building in Rwanda, and it was built by the Chinese. And so as a child in the 80s, we used to say, oh, they eat dogs. And it was the first time seeing somebody who's not black. We would see mm -hmm. them from far, but really running 
because eventually they would say that, oh, they eat people, and they eat children, and you know, all the things that they say about the Chinese. And mm -hmm. that's my first memory of, of othering. Mm -hmm. But it's, what was happening in Rwanda was very subtle because neighbors, literally, people who live next to each other, they, they have this othering that they transfer through children. And you can see a child would be in a, in a household playing with other children, it's lunchtime, and he's been told that he should never eat their food. Mm -hmm. right? and, and so he is going to say, I am not hungry, or I am running. Now my family, so my father, my family was considered Hutu. My father uh, somehow ended up in, in uh, mingling with the political elite in the early 80s. One of them then is suspected of plotting a coup d'etat goes into exile. My father is one then of the people who have to be jailed for treason and all of that. Eventually, the person who went into exile comes back as the leader of the RPF, which is now the invading political uh, uh, rebellion. But it's seen as Tutsi, seen as a Tutsi rebellion, but he is Hutu, because they want to tell the world that this is not about Tutsis and Hutus. It's, 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 it's a patriotic movement. Mm. But anybody who had ties to him, whether you were a Hutu or a Tutsi, you were an enemy. Mm -hmm. So uh, although my family was considered Hutu, because of my father's political profile, even though he dies before the invasion, uh, put us on the wrong side of the fence. So that fear, I didn't feel it. But I have memories of my mother really grappling with it and trying to tell us to be safe. And, and you know, the conversations we had about the fact that we are not different, but we are very different. And in, in, in April 94, it's literally so different that we have to die. And, and they actually came for us. And it's a night I can talk about for a long time. They you know, killed people at home, threw a grenade in the house. My mother literally escaped a, a bullet at, at, at her, burnt her eye, but she survived. And, and for the three months of the, the genocide, I was the one, I was 13, but I was the only one who could go out and get vegetables and get the different things that we needed to survive. And along the way, I witnessed what was happening in the streets, but no one else at home could go. In so many ways, I was saved my, by my, <laughs> my childhood uh, and the fact that um, I was a Hutu, but actually we were, we were the bad Hutus, the mm. unwanted Hutus, the traitors, the ones who are also called cockroaches. Mm. Um, now, fast forward now, the word survivor in Rwanda is very sensitive, it's extremely political. So even though you would be a Hutu who has lived that kind of life, you can easily be attacked for saying that you are a genocide survivor. Mm. Because by definition, a survivor is a Tutsi who managed to survive the genocide that happened in Rwanda. So um, uh, it's, even post-genocide, among the people who are in Rwanda, there is this one and that one, and that one is the other. Mm -hmm. So there is, and only this kind of survivor is legitimate, and the other one, you can't be a survivor if you are a Hutu. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a very strange um, um, mixture of, of uh, feelings, uh, and, and every individual would literally subtly or or very clearly have uh, different things pushing at them in that mm. context. And it's always this matter of what is reality and what is perception. Um, what, what is the, the, the individual truth if in the context of a group? Um, and and uh, I want to... Um, I want to quote something that Fred, one of your characters, a young character in, in your novel says, we must develop a strong stomach for the truth, 
the unvarnished truth. And, and the one thing that I think saves all our think thinking, anybody who is willing to go beyond that fear, is, is the truth. When, when we start really exploring and, and finding those ways of actually speaking from within each individual experience. Um, but I do wonder, you know, even, I knew what I was going to read in your book. I didn't know what I was going to read in your book, Fred. You, it, it, in, in your story, you really take no prisoners. It is a very difficult story that exposes violence, xenophobia, human trafficking, um, uh, violence against women and children. So, so it's, you know, it is a young adult novel, but it's very difficult to read. And the story that, that, that you portray, w w one is also aware of them, but the moment you start really looking closely at, at the dynamics of what that kind of fear and hatred can lead to, it's extremely difficult. And yet, we don't have a choice. We have to look at this. Uh, we have to understand. And I wonder, as individuals, as, as, as a writer, as a researcher, as somebody who has lived the, the worst that a human being can experience in the context of xenophobia, of that fear, how, uh, how do you now channel that into creating spaces for those truths beyond writing books in your everyday life? How do you encounter people? How, how do you actually translate the knowledge that you have into everyday lived experience? Um, as a journalist and a creative writer, I think my function is to provoke debate create a platform uh, for people to interact and uh, take the, the story further, uh, the debate further. Uh, the, one of the tragic things about um, how we deal with truth that we've just alluded to is, uh, and let's go back to the TRC process, a very noble intervention, noble idea, uh, which unfortunately we treated as a as an event. Mm. Oh, we've done this, it's beautiful, we get all the blood, it's from all over the world that we are opening up as a society, we are talking about our past and so on. But it was a process, it was an event. Instead of allowing it to, to drag on a bit, we said, okay, two years, three years, we've had the hearings, the books have been written, uh, let's move on, let's forget the past. And it's, it will continue to haunt us as long as we try and shut those debates, those uh, talks. So uh, I think my contribution as a writer, that's all I can do, is to keep provoking these debates, these talks, that let's talk about it in all its manifestation. It's a very complicated uh, past that we have come from. Every now and then we, see, we think we, we have broken with that past and uh, we, we have people Embracing a new narrow nationalism, as we have seen in my province, uh, all of a sudden people are rewriting history about some individuals. They are now being put on pedestals as the, as the leaders of, uh, of this nation. Uh, I mean, let's not uh, beat about the bush. A lot of people think Butelezi now is the god. He is the, he is the messiah. He is the uh, oracle, but we know what he did in the past. And uh, what, what gets my goat is he refused to be part of the TRC process. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have people like him, um, but there were also some Afrikaners in government who refused to participate in the TRC process. As long as we have those uh, denialists, we will never um, deal with our terrible past. And if we haven't, um, really dealt with that terrible past decisively and exhaustively, it will keep haunting us and we can't move on uh, to the future, to our envisaged future. So we need to talk about this. I will continue writing in my newspaper columns. I'll continue writing in my, 
in my um, pieces of creative writing because I believe we still need to talk more about it. The TRC shouldn't have stopped as an event. It should continue as a process, a, as a healing process. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, um, just about also, I, I also feel like, you know, what Fred said about writing to make people think, to um, provoke debate. And then another thing which I felt why I wanted to write the book um, was that I'd already written about these events, these themes already in the form of reports and in the form of my PhD thesis. And I felt that neither of them successfully humanized the actors and the people. Mm -hmm. And I felt that the reports were maybe a bit black and white. The PhD thesis was a bit theoretical and generalized, but they lacked color. They lacked like these lived human subjects who we can, even if we don't agree and we despise what we do, we can to some degree empathize or understand them. And so with this book, I was just trying to bring to life these, in many instances, flawed people, but who are nonetheless people, so that people from different backgrounds and maybe different points of view can at least understand, um, yeah, can kind of understand each other and see that, see beyond the stereotypes and beyond these very simplistic narratives and also understand the complexity of people and our society and maybe through engaging with that find better ways to move forward and to kind of erode the kind of resentment that people have mm -hmm. based on these very simplified notions of um, migration, of foreigners, and of South Africans. It's not a book that aims to demonize South Africans either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, other than uh, working with refugees and, and migrants and telling them, because the one thing I know is a big trap is this, I mean, transit, I'll go somewhere else. I know people who have been in transit for 20 years, really encouraging them to think, you know, settle, you are going to experience South Africa differently. Even the, the whole xenophobia uh, is experienced differently when you decide to make this home. Mm. Other than doing that, I, I'm trying to reach out to uh, the, the powers that be in South Africa, to people who can do something about it, to really care about the image of South Africa on the rest of the continent. Um, because I think uh, here in South Africa, you can call the, it xenophobia, or criminal elements destabilizing this, or uh, you know, people, whatever the name you give it, the cost to South Africa now and in the long run is so high and it's the same, irrespective of what you call it. Uh, I mean, I, just very quick short stories. I'm in Liberia and I see somebody with a Bafana Bafana shirt. This is in 2015. I go to him, we, we, I say, Bafana Bafana. He's surprised in Monrovia who talks about Bafana Bafana. And then he tells me he's a radio producer. And he tells me he, his management is putting him under pressure to report on the xenophobia in South Africa because we were in the middle of an episode. Mm. Of, and, and he was hoping it would blow off because he doesn't want to portray South Africa on a UN radio in the region. And so he, so is a South African No, no, no. Okay. He was a Ugandan radio producer. Ah, okay. right. But he cared so much about the image of South Africa that he didn't want to produce a show talking about the xenophobia in South Africa. Mm. But his management was telling him, it's current affairs. You have to do it. He was really hoping that it will blow off that he doesn't have to do that. Now, that's one. Um, then I, I land in Ethiopia, my driver, uh, the shuttle. The first thing he asks me was, you are from South Africa? I said, yes. And then he started telling me things in local languages in South Africa, Tswana, Zulu. And then I, I didn't respond to the Tswana because I don't speak. And then he said, ah, you're not South African. I said, no. And then he said, I hate South Africans. Mm. 
Oh. Now, this is, a, this is a shuttle driver in Addis Ababa. Those of you who know Addis Ababa, it's the capital of the diplomatic capital. Yeah, I don't know how many people he tells that story, but he said he almost got burnt in a shop in Malanga. Mm. And he hates South Africans. And he told me all the, 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 the bad things about them. And I'm thinking, this is damaging. This is really damaging. How many people he shuttles from the airport, whatever <laughs> positions that they are, who get to hear this story. I go to Cote d'Ivoire, and somebody sees my travel document. It's not a passport. It's a travel document. But it says South Africa. The very decorated immigration officer, a woman, um, she she tells me, you South Africans, black, you black South Africans should stay in your countries and never go anywhere. He, she said it in French. So I said, excuse me, ma'am. So, uh, and in that moment, I was thinking, do, do I say, no, 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 I'm not South African? Or do I actually engage? Now, through my training, thankfully, I said, OK, ma'am, I'm actually interested. Tell me more. But what you mean? And the tension, she kind of dropped her shoulders, stared at my passport, and then she said, you know, as a young girl, I remember running through the streets of Abidjan with, with, with boards and, and shouting, libere Mandela, libere Mandela, you know, which means free Mandela in Abidjan as a schoolgirl. And then she said, and hey, now my brothers and sisters are in South Africa, and they are just looking for bread, and you are killing them. And then I said, isn't that sad? And then she said, it really is. And then we both realized I'm on a queue. And she took my travel document and she stamped it. She said, welcome to Cote d'Ivoire. Hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, afterwards I'm thinking, but this thing that is happening in South Africa, somebody should have a job whose sole purpose is to manage the image of South Africa. And I don't, I don't get a sense that South Africans uh, politicians, or, or uh, I don't get a sense that it's being handled. No. I, I really don't. Mm -hmm. And the cost to South Africa is so high now and in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I spend really time, any <laughs> government official that I meet who has something to do with diplomacy or is influential enough, I tell them. If anybody yeah. in government is here, I've got just I, I, I tell them. I do, because it's really important. Yeah, you know? okay. yeah I mean, uh, just as a follow-up on that, I mean, up two or three weeks ago, an MEC of Health uh, in the Northwest was recorded, with her permission, uh, confronting this Zimbabwean uh, uh, person who was a patient at the hospital. hospital. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. You know, it shows that uh, even at the top, they don't yeah. care. Yeah. about the image, about uh, the possible damage it might do uh, to the image of the country. Not just, <clears throat> their hard comments were not damaging only uh, to the image, because these are the kind of comments that can be interpreted by masses. I'm sure in your research you would, you, you, you would know, the, you mentioned mob mentality. Mm. That's the kind of fuel mm. that you, you throw on a, on a mob to douse with Mm. with the mentality, because you are giving them a legitimate, and I'm using legitimate, legitimate in inverted commas, you are mobilizing them, uniting them, that's the word you used, mm. you are uniting them about a cause, let's protect our healthcare system, which is, mm. but what you are actually doing is you are designating somebody as the responsible one, and therefore the unwanted one. And not after that, mm. Not long after that, another politician said, ah, I support her. I will mm. disconnect the oxygen yeah, you know, yeah. from, from that. Mm -hmm. And then now we hear that they're going to have a nationwide uh, you know, at, at, yeah. at all the hospitals. And it's actually deflecting from the real issue. Uh, the absolutely. The healthcare exactly. system is in jeopardy and oh. needs to be addressed and needs oh. to be solved for oh. all people living in South Africa. And that's yeah. the point. And the distance now from just talking about it to actually doing something about it. And I mean the masses doing something about it in an extreme way. The, the, the distance is getting very, very shorter and shorter and shorter. And, and um, I hope that it doesn't get where they cross the line and, and the solution is to actually start mm. you know, beating people up or killing them. 
Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time for our discussion here, so we are going to take questions. Uh, but before we do, I just want to quote something very beautiful from the end of your book. Okay. I was convinced that it was possible to be seen as a worthy human being above all else. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what we need to realize about everybody no matter where they come from, what their backgrounds are. So, um, any questions from the audience? Here in front? Uh, could you just wait for the microphone? It's coming. Hi. Uh, this is for my friend from Rwanda. I, my understanding of what is going on in Rwanda right now um, from the leadership is that the discussion of the differences between Hutus and Tutsis are not allowed. So that, um, and that peace, the message is supposed to be peace, 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 and that there's nothing else um, that you're able to say outside. And I've had people tell me that, that I could hear differences maybe in South Africa between Rwandans, but not if I was in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So when you all talk about having to um, take no prisoners and really have an open dialogue, how do you do that in Rwanda right now in the political climate that is happening under Kagame? Well, the short answer is you don't. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the thing, what you said is it's not allowed. That is, so to say we are all Rwandan and we are moving forward, it's noble. It's great. We actually want that. And at the same time, when it's convenient, you have to make sure that people say it was a genocide against Tutsis. And obviously, acknowledging that they are Tutsis. It's not a Rwandan genocide. Rwanda uh, uh, submitted a petition to the United Nations to change uh, from Rwandan genocide to genocide against the Tutsis. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so, l rightly so, by the way, rightly so, because it, it, it was. Um, and at the same time, in Rwanda, you can't actually mention the word Hutu or Tutsi. Uh, now, my concern for me is more about the pain and the uh, the trauma that we have lived through. I know from experience, because I have had the fortune of living in South Africa where I can talk about it freely. I know that's how I got to heal. I know that's how I got to be able to openly talk about it. And I fear for my people that uh, whatever the end goal or the reason or the purpose might be, not having a chance to process what has happened to us is extremely damaging now and in the future. It just so happens that it's such an inconvenient conversation to manage in the country politically that the decision is do not allow it oh. because it's so inconvenient. Because if you talk about Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda, you are going to ask questions that should not be asked. And, and so it's unfortunate, uh, and at the same time, the whole we are all Rwandans and moving forward, I cannot fully dismiss it. There is something positive and beautiful and uniting about it. The question is, is it sustainable? And it's not a question for which I have an answer. And uh, I think it's still morning. My name is Abdikad. I'd like to make a comment at the same time, ask some questions. I'm not sure about the names of the two gentlemen uh, who are the panelists. I know Fanya. Uh, but so you'll help me to address them by their names. It is Fred and P. Pacific. Okay, I'm not good with French. That sounds <laughs> French. <laughs> I'll allow you to just say P. Pierre, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the first comment I would like to make uh, and also ask a question is with regards to the issue that uh, P has uh, 
spoken about othering through children. Uh, this experience that we have uh, in the townships, uh, when I'm saying the townships, I mean Somalis running spaza shops in the townships, where young children of the age of one year or two years at the back of their mothers calling people who are working in those shops my friends or my friend, or even saying don't belong here. Small child at the back of the mother, mm. which is actually talking to the point where you said othering through children. And recently we even had a young boy of the age of eight years saying that when I finish high school, I do not need to go and look for a job because I will be getting protection money from the Somalis, eight years old. That is othering through children. And uh, the question I want to ask you is uh, if it's possible to highlight something that just uh, is new this morning. The mayor of Musina, who was attending a meeting on immigration and local government, has just said this morning, we must minimize the rights of migrants and migrants, I quote, they must be made uncomfortable. What do you see if you, what do you do if you see a cockroach in your house, you buy doom. That is his statement. Sure. That is the mayor of Musina. Just this morning, he made that statement. I'm sure Fred was talking about the MEC for Limpopo of Health. He was talking about Gaten Mackenzie and all those people. But it's the, more, the, the story is building up. So my question to you, P, is uh, can you just highlight something about the cockroach? Because now migrants are cockroaches in South Africa. And people must go and buy doom to kill them. That's the question to you. And then the other one is with regards to the issue of denialism. Deny what is the reality. I think this is Fred who have mentioned that. Uh, most of the time, government officials, when they are asked about issues of xenophobia or sentiments that are made by political leaders or politicians, there is the element of denialism. For example, the president was questioned when he was uh, having the question and answer session in parliament. He was asked about the comments made by politicians like the MEC and all those things that have been said by the DA leader. And the element of denialism is the first answer he gives. We are not xenophobic. What could be the solution to that kind of uh, behavior whereby even if you kill somebody because of xenophobia and you say you don't belong here and it's clear outside there, the highest ranking person, number one in South Africa, the first citizen, says it's not xenophobia. And for many years, that denialism is there. If you don't accept the reality of something happening, how will you get the solution? That's the, the question I wanted to ask. And uh, Vanya, uh, you mentioned the issue of uh, calling, maybe some, making some phone calls for Somalis. That's true. I, I, I witnessed that. I, I know what you have uh, done, supporting many people struggling. How does it make you feel as a South African when a Somali makes a phone call, either an ambulance or a hospital or somewhere else, or even uh, a government office, and doesn't get help or gets kicked out or you know blocked or something? But when you make the same phone call, you get that respect. How does that make you feel? Thank you so much. Should I start? Should start? <laughs> yeah, it's weird because on the one hand, there's a kind of relief. Okay, well, this is so easy for me. So, you know, but then you've also realized how difficult it is for other people. And um, yeah, so there's, there's an awareness and, and guiltily also an appreciation that you know, I'm lucky that this is so simple for me. Um, but I know um, that, and for, you know, also an awareness that unfortunately, um, there are people who are completely invisible in our society who get shrugged off, who won't be spoken to, and yeah, this underbelly of our society and realization how for you know, I guess not just for foreigners, but, you know, I think also black South Africans, um, how, how difficult it is to do basic things based on their background. 
Fred, could you respond to your part of the question? I, I thought it was more of a comment, because really, um, yeah, it was more of a comment of what I, what, so I okay. don't think there's anything to say. Could you? Uh, you your question is, what, what do we do about denialism? We can just call it out, we, we comment on it, um, but what, because what else can you do if these people who are in power are in, are in denial? Uh, you call them out, well, some of us are privileged enough to, you have the platform, like you have um, the mic figuratively, and uh, uh, I mean uh, even, uh, uh, yeah, figuratively you have the mic, you have the voice, I have the voice as a newspaper man. But there are limitations, of course. Um, do they take the media seriously anymore? I, I doubt it, because uh, we have been railing and raving about corruption, about how they behave. Uh, but of course, I think ours as journalists is to continue um, uh, making these calls, continue railing against them, continue calling them out. That is what we did during apartheid. That is what we can still do here. We have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I will answer my question actually drawing from this because one thing life is faithful ab about is that it gives you feedback. If you don't acknowledge it, it doesn't disappear. It gets bigger. And my, my concern for denialism is that it's going to get bigger, bigger until it cannot be denied. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right. Now, we are now, as you said, in the territory of dehumanizing the other. Uh, in, in my book, I write about um, uh, somebody who was being killed. They didn't really kill him completely. And, 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 and the sister of the person who was doing the killing pleads with her, with him. So she pleads with him to go and, and finish, finish him off out of compassion. And I remember his words. He said, no, no, no. That's what cockroaches deserve. In his mind, he was not killing a human being. In his mind, he was killing a cockroach. And, 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 and this, is, this is a very slippery slope, and it's extremely dangerous, because when you stop seeing a human being as a human being, mm. they are not just the other, but they are not a human being, they're a cockroach, and you are in a position of power, you can be sure somebody will take it to heart and they will act as if it is true. What you're going to find is that it's the first politicians who will be the first ones to distance themselves from what the people have done. That's not what I meant, they will say. Mm -hmm. But it's a very dangerous, slippery slope until somebody literally stands up and says, enough. We started a little bit late, so I do not uh, feel that we have taken more uh, time than we were allocated. So, um, but this is going to be the last question. Thank you so much to everybody for being here, for listening, for wanting to engage in this topic. Thank you to the three of you. Thank you, Thank you for writing these remarkable books. They are not easy reads, but they are very, very important reads. And I think if we want to recognize the worthiness of every human being, mm we need to look at truth no matter how difficult it is and we need to engage with it and we need to conquer the fears that we have of anything that is foreign and different from us. So thank you so much. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the festival and the office will be available for signing outside and please do read, engage. It's a way forward, a small step, but it's a way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.